Okay, really? Bro, people can read faster than that. You don't need such a basic disclaimer to go on for that long. I'm sure you want people to read it, but it does not take 22 seconds to read a fair use disclaimer like this. Look, I could go into detail about this, but like at the end of the day, the counter argument is just who cares? This is small and you're kind of right. But if I'm just like, OK, get on with it on the first thing you show me, you don't think maybe you're dragging your ass a little too much. So, my old nemesis. I can already tell there's gonna be people finding out about this video and their knee-jerk reaction is just gonna be, Why are you talking about this movie again? It happened three years ago. Stop reigniting your hate for a movie you personally didn't like and move on. Well, for a couple of reasons. One, this movie has a tendency to appear as a trending subject on Twitter and has been doing so for years since it first came out. So don't try to tell me this topic isn't relevant anymore. The Last Jedi, regardless of how you feel about it, has always been a highly topical film given the subject matter. It doesn't really matter how long ago it came out because that's not an actual limit to what can and cannot be discussed in terms of media. Okay, so while it's a fair point to note something that's been around for a while should still be up for critique, and in fact a revisiting after the fact can provide better insight, you should also have something new to say if you're going to cover something again. For example, could I re-review episodes of Powerpuff Girls 2016 that I've already reviewed? Sure, I totally could, nothing's stopping me. But if I don't have anything new to bring to that topic, then there's no point, especially since I have a tendency to wait and look at the whole picture instead of shotgunning my opinion out as fast as possible without taking the time to ensure what I have to say has some kind of staying power. So, you think maybe it's something other than just time that makes people ask why you continue covering this topic? Oh, but let's get on your reasoning and proof of it trending. I mean, your screenshot there sure does show that The Last Jedi was trending on Twitter with like less than 2,000 tweets and no date. Meanwhile, let's take a look at some trending topics from literally while I'm scripting this part of the video. Let's see, we've got the Zodiac Killer for some reason. Special report, I think that's a news thing. Kawaki, what? Okay. Hashtag Twitch leak. Oh yeah, that was going on around this time. Boy, I'm sure dating this part of the script, aren't I? Roblox TOS. Tyson Fury. Okay. Hashtag defund at and Smallest of those trends about a fucking Boruto character is still bigger than your last Jedi trend. And your screenshot has nothing in terms of date, but then again, neither does mine. Not something you can just get easily. Fair enough. So... I'll just provide data to show that the engagement in relation to Last Jedi is not what you make it out to be. Google Analytics data. I started in 2014, a year before the release of Force Awakens, to be as charitable as possible getting this data. As you can see here, the film has 100% of its search engagement around the time of the release and further spikes around both of the other movie releases. Alongside a couple of lesser spikes between Force Awakens and Last Jedi that coincide the release with Lo Rogue One and Last Jedi's trailer. Now, Easy to say that it's related to the engagement with Star Wars as a whole, so let's just make that comparison. While it is talked about more when the movies come out, any other time it tends to maintain being about 10% of the overall Star Wars disclosure or less. I mean, yeah, it's still relevant, but really no more relevant than any other Star Wars movie. Hell, there was even a peak at the end of 2020 that doesn't even move the needle for the discussion of Last Jedi at all. So what does that tell you? See, and here's the thing. I'm not even saying that you shouldn't talk about this movie or that its age is relevant to the discussion, but the issue with you continuing to talk about this movie is, well, related to that comment you put on screen. You already discussed this in a very thorough manner, and it's not like the discussion is moving towards Last Jedi more than other Star Wars movies. So, you know, why bring it back up when you were so thorough with it in the first place? And two, this is Star Wars we're talking about. Star Wars will always be a relevant topic of discussion until the planet explodes because it's only the biggest franchise in the history of Western media. Now, see, why didn't you just fucking say that instead? People are willing to harp on the prequels until the end of time, so why shouldn't you be allowed to harp on how bad you think this movie is too? G granted, what you say next does point towards why people would have a problem with this, so let's just get to that. For those who may not know, I previously talked about this movie when it was sort of new, I guess. It recently came out on Blu-ray and DVD, and it was terrible back then. Well, guess what? Three years have gone by, and it's still terrible. There is literally no excuse for this movie turning out as horribly as it did. 
Even now, it still baffles me how it was even possible for this movie to fuck up as colossally as it did. But on the other hand, this is something that I talked about in detail before. Exactly! You discussed this in detail so people would naturally think you may not have much new to say about it. Which, to be fair... So I'm gonna try and do my best to bring up arguments that I didn't use the first time. Because there is actually very little to like about this movie. From its story, to its writing, to its characters, to its themes, to its awful continuity, to its production. You do state your intent to do. And this also has the context of Rise of Skywalker that your original review had, so I do agree with you that this isn't as superfluous as it sounds. However, it remains to see if you have an actual fucking point here. Now, the rest of this intro segment is boring, uninteresting drivel about the direction of the Star Wars franchise, but some notable language gets used that indicates where the standpoint is going without outright stating it. I'll openly admit that I was one of the people who felt optimistic about The Force Awakens when it first came out. It was a very flawed experience, but it still had some good stuff in it and left open a lot of possible directions for the story to go. But now, because of The Last Jedi and Rise of Skywalker, The Force Awakens is a movie that has only gotten more sour and aged more poorly with the passage of time. Because it ended up going nowhere, and now, it means nothing. Is that really indicative of the quality of an individual film, though? I mean, The Empire Strikes Back was still considered an amazing movie before the existence of Return of the Jedi. Now, there's some comparison to be made here, and I hate to tell you this, but it shows Last Jedi to be less reliant on context than Empire Strikes Back. But perhaps that's a story for another time, because this isn't about The Force Awakens. This is about The Last Jedi, and I eagerly await the people on Twitter or elsewhere complaining about the news that I'm talking about this movie for the billionth time. But, like I said before, I really don't care at this point. Is, um, that why you keep bringing it up? Because you don't care? It's almost like you already discussed why you don't take that complaint seriously, and now you're saying you don't care again, within a couple of minutes of pointing out the reasons you don't care. I don't know, it really makes it sound like you actually care. Seriously, I normally don't like the argument of, if you don't care, why are you talking about it, when someone mentions not caring about something once, but this is very different. This is basically you harping on how few fucks you give to the point where you sound like an attention-grubbing whore. Or Supify, one of the two. Because even to this day, I'm still trying to figure out how this could have happened. How was it possible for this movie to go so wrong? Even with everything that's come out about this mess of a sequel trilogy since The Rise of Skywalker, it still feels like we missed something because it just gets worse and worse as time goes on. Okay, so in an early video of mine, I talked about how most of the time the don't like it, don't watch it argument gets horribly misused. This is one of those times where it's used correctly that I was talking about in that video. You keep watching a movie that you actively hate and apparently keep finding things to hate about it, you sound like the subject of a Mariah Carey song right now, to the point where I, with only the slightest amount of hyperbole, only the slightest, expect you to say that this movie fucked your dog and shot your wife. Calm down. It's a movie. But as horrible as The Rise of Skywalker is, it wasn't necessarily the movie that started the avalanche. That honor goes to this movie, in which there were many, many think pieces about it, about how it was either the best Star Wars film since The Empire Strikes Back, <laughs> no. Or one of the worst things to ever happen in the history of cinema. And while I wouldn't say this about The Last Jedi, at least not on its own, it's definitely understandable why people felt that way. Yes! This is the behavior of an adult. Laugh at the fact that Last Jedi's quality is a point of contention within Star Wars fan base, something that might be, you know, the real reason people think you continuing to harp on it is dumb, while saying that those who think it's the worst have an understandable viewpoint. Like, honestly, part of the reason people really hate this fucking thing as much as they do is because they don't like change, but no, I'll get there. One way or another, this was pretty much the Star Wars movie that started the great divide between people who like the Star Wars sequel trilogy and people who like good movies. And I suppose there's really no harm in revisiting the reasons why. You know, you're right. There's not. There's harm in your blatantly elitist attitude. See, this is the reason why people think bronies are the scum of the earth. Well, okay, yeah, there's that other guy, but we don't talk about pedophiles on this channel. Hello? There's how many more? To see just how bad, or just how bad, this movie has aged in the last three years, especially since The Rise of Skywalker came out. 
And just to let people know before we move forward, no matter what you see and no matter what happens in this video, just try to bear with me because trust me, it gets worse. It gets... way fucking worse. So, remember, this is supposed to be looking at the movie through the lens of having seen Rise of Skywalker. Eventually, he is going to talk about the behind-the-scenes stuff, and yeah, let's just say that I can't wait to dissect that as someone who actually fucking knows how movies are made. But, we all gotta start somewhere, and this movie's already pretty damn bad, so let's go. And what better way to start this off by doing what we did last time, starting off with the opening crawl. So, you're gonna present arguments that you didn't present last time. And thus you decide to start the body of your video in the exact same way. Good. I, I didn't want my brain cells today. Okay, goodbye. Have, have a good day at school. I don't even go to school anymore. What the fuck? I know it may come across as a little bit mundane, but I'm sorry, this is simply not excusable. When the movie manages to screw up with the first three words, literally the first three words, it's just not painting a good sign. Kinda like how if a video messes up with the fucking disclaimer, it's not a good sign? Even though it seems mundane? Yeah, my initial criticism seems a lot more relevant now, doesn't it? Also, people are getting the joke in my opening crawl right about... Uh... I talked before about how ridiculous it is that the Order was somehow reigning when the previous film ended with them losing a shitload of resources and taking a huge defeat after the Star Killer was destroyed. But after putting more time into thinking about it, I started to realize this was explained in the previous movie just fine? That this isn't the problem. It's a symptom of the problem. That's not what you were gonna say? Ah, well allow me to guide your amoeboid brain through what happened before the Star Killer was destroyed. Do you? Remember how the Star Killer displayed its power? By getting rid of the entire New Republic? Well, technically not the entire New Republic, but we'll get there. Did you just forget about that part? You know, all those planets, how Huck stated that getting rid of the New Republic would cut off the Resistance resources, all that shit. Yeah, that big loss on the side of the First Order was preceded by the predominant governmental body that isn't the First Order being evaporated. They lost a single fucking base while the New Republic is basically space dust. Not hard to figure out how the First Order is in control now, is it? At least not for someone with two brain cells to rub together. Yeah, y'all getting the old stone cold now, how you like it? The actual problem is that this plot point has no buildup. You might have heard a common complaint with The Force Awakens and that the First Order just showed up out of nowhere from the ashes of the old Empire. We're just supposed to accept that this Order suddenly rose to power and that the Republic was incompetent to stop it. Okay, so as much as movies try to sell the cut the head off the snake tactic in dealing with a military force, and this is an especially prevalent complaint with Star Wars, mind you, assassinating the leader while good at putting forces on the back foot, does not result in automatic victory. It's not realistic that the Empire falls because the Emperor dies. There are still other people who were loyal to their cause, so it stands to reason they could survive. And that same complaint can be lodged towards anything. So you mean to tell me that the Galactic Empire was too incompetent to stop the Rebellion from being a threat? You mean to tell me that the Galactic Empire was too incompetent to stop the New Republic from rising to power in the first place? You mean to tell me that the United States was too incompetent to stop Al-Qaeda and ISIS from forming? Yeah, maybe that last one will be proof enough of why your argument of they didn't establish how it happened is dog piss. There's no explanation for how this happened, and you can't just hand wave it away with one sentence of information. The purpose of the prequel trilogy was to detail what led to Palpatine's rise to power in the OT. How he took advantage of the Jedi Order's flawed ideology and exploited the Republic's weaknesses. Nothing like that is given here. It's just these guys took the old Empire's place and we're back to square one. <laughs> okay, there's a big difference between those two instances, my guy. First of all, the prequels were about Anakin Skywalker's descent to the dark side and Palpatine's rise to power, so it happens to be part of that story. Whereas the existence of the First Order is what's important to Rey's story in the sequel trilogy and not how the First Order happened. But if we're gonna go deep on comparing to the OT, oh, that's gonna bite you in the ass real hard here in a moment. Now, it might have been one thing if they gave us a legitimate explanation for how they rose to power in the next two movies, but the answers we ended up getting turned out to be blatant bullshit. This opening crawl has the exact same problem. 
they don't take the time to establish or elaborate anything that's going on here. We have no picture of how far reaching the villains are, how powerful they are, or how they recovered so quickly. No picture of how powerful, far reaching, or how they recovered from the opening crawl. All right, OT comparison time. Keep in mind that A New Hope also ends with the destruction of a massive super weapon capable of wiping out the entire good guy team. So in spite of the final shot of the last movie being a fucking medal ceremony, Empire Strikes Back outright states that in spite of the destruction of Death Star, the Imperials still have a Starfleet that's driving the rebels out of hiding. So not only does the beginning of Empire Strikes Back give about the same amount of context, the opening to Empire is actually less relevant because The Last Jedi entirely depicts the First Order's fleet chasing down the Resistance and picking them off little by little, with the first scene depicting the Resistance narrowly escaping their hiding spot, which we know was exposed at the end of the last movie because it was being aimed at by the Star Killer. You know... Kind of like how the Death Star was aiming at the Rebellion's base of operations in A New Hope, thus why there's no question of why the Empire has the upper hand at the beginning of Episode 5. This explanation is really gonna bite you in the ass harder later too! That's right, double ass bites! Even if we are to assume that it's because the Order had more stations or the Republic's planets that got blown up dealt a crucial blow to the Resistance, it still comes across as jarring because the Force Awakens treated the destruction of the Star Killer as a strong win for the good guys and even the playing field. The movie ended on an optimistic note that the good guys were fighting back. So why are they suddenly losing? Or you know, I guess the first time that one bites you in the ass again is right now. Again, this is supposed to be indicative that The Last Jedi is worse than what's in the OT, right? For one, hopeful that the Resistance is fighting back doesn't mean that they fucking won. They still lost the government that was shadow funding them and have had their location completely exposed, which actually makes more sense than Empire. See, remember how I mentioned that the Rebellion had their locations exposed at the end of A New Hope? Yeah. They apparently had enough time on Yavin 4 to have a whole fucking medal ceremony before scattering, whereas the Resistance just stood there and watched Rey leave, no big celebration to be had. Force Awakens ends as though there's still a fight to be had, whereas New Hope ends like that was the end of the war. So are you sure you want to say that the sequel trilogy is the one that ends on a hopeful note that gets ignored in the next movie? Why is the Republic suddenly just gone? BECAUSE IT WAS LITERALLY WIPED OFF THE FACE OF THE GALAXY, YOU NERF HERDER! Okay, let me do this with a little more nuance. Technically speaking, it is possible that the remnants of the New Republic still exist. Although the movie does point out that there are allies at the fringes of the galaxy that chose not to help. So the movie winds up explaining that away for us. What they actually blew up was about the entire system surrounding the Galactic Senate. So, what do you think? It's gonna do to the Republic. Having its entire fucking government obliterated. This is a situation where cutting off the head of the snake actually does kill the body, unlike what killing one guy would do. Why is only one side winning when both sides faced huge losses at the end of the last film? Because one side lost damn near anything, and the other side lost a space station. Like, you can see the scale of losses when comparing this movie to the last. The Resistance has a few bombers and a small fleet, while the First Order has multiple destroyer-class vessels at their disposal. The first fucking skirmish of the movie can tell you exactly how much loss was incurred by both sides. Or, here's another comparison. The First Order lost one planet, and the Resistance lost, I feel like I've said this before, a whole fucking system. So who the fuck lost more then? It raises a whole bunch of questions that are never answered, which drags you out of the experience. And it heavily reduces the sense of tension because the stakes aren't properly established, creating a lack of investment. Except, you, you don't even need the context of the previous movie to establish stakes. Properly establishing stakes in a movie really doesn't have anything to do with what the movie before it did. Although the movie before it can inform those stakes, but the stakes in this movie are the stakes in this movie. I've already debunked you on the level of whether this meshes with the previous movie, so let's talk about establishing stakes properly within this movie then. All right, so the opening crawl tells you that the First Order is seizing military control of the galaxy and the Resistance are fighting against that. So, uh, tell me, what's at stake there? Sounds like control of the galaxy to me. 
Uh, notably, this also tells us the importance of Luke Skywalker to the fight, something that gets hammered home by damn near everyone throughout the entire movie. Luke is considered the key to this fight. So, yeah, you don't exactly need the previous movie to tell you the stakes. These movies should still be viewable as individual experiences. That's part of the point of an opening crawl, to give a series-wide context if you come in the middle of a series. And it's why movies end on a story beat that concludes an arc, even if there's another movie to come. Ray finds Luke at the end of the movie. The Resistance is focused on survival instead of finding Luke because they have someone out there who knows where he is. It concludes the arc of searching for Luke. So now the theme shifts to... Actually, I think I need to save that for later. I was holding in that burp. That's not the reason I need to save for later. I just do it in later in the script. It feels like an entire other movie just happened off screen and all this stuff with Leia and the gang being chased by Hux and the First Order has no context behind it. They're not choosing to stay consistent with the world building here. It's just this happened because that happened with no explanation for how and why. Remember when I said that my explanation was going to bite you in the ass? Here we go. Yet another ass bite. So Leia and the Resistance are literally leaving the base they were at at the ending of Force Awakens for this entire chase. Since this movie takes place, no joke, immediately after the end of the previous movie. Give or take a couple hours, perhaps. But you know what movie takes place further out from when the previous movie ended with what is the equivalent of this movie's plot happening entirely off screen? The Empire Strikes Back. Yeah, they weren't exactly on Hoth at the end of A New Hope, were they? The opening crawl even says that after getting found out in their current location, Luke and several others hid on Hoth from the Empire. In fact, the sequence in question bears striking similarity to not just the beginning of Empire Strikes Back except in space, but even further similarity to the end of Last Jedi in terms of visual representation. In other words, there wasn't a whole movie between Force Awakens and Last Jedi, at least not in terms of story. But it seems more likely for there to be at least most of a movie between New Hope and Empire. In other words, not only is this something that doesn't make Last Jedi worse than the OT, it is an area that makes the sequel trilogy, in theory, more cohesive than the OT. At least, by your standards of how things should be set up. Leia's crew got back to the fleet, fled to some random planet, and are now being chased by the entire First Order, and there's just too many holes in how it's presented. I really should have skipped this because once again, all I can do is repeat the point I already made in another way. They were on Dakar. The next target of the Star Killer was Dakar. They were already being pursued. This takes place within 24 hours of the end of the last movie. You dumb. But something about the video overall, this kind of points out. Bro, your points are super repetitive. How many times can you say, this wasn't established well, before you think we get the point? God, it's like you have the opposite problem of what the movie has, where the movie is trusting your intelligence enough to not hold your hand and give you the capability of putting two and two together for yourself instead of spelling out the answer like a kindergartner that's the age of a sixth grader that they've been held back so much, whereas you, you're the one treating your audience like the kindergartner that's been held back. Dude, do, do you just expect your audience to be that dumb? I mean, granted, you're a brownie, but whew, boy. We haven't gotten to the actual movie yet, and the story is already showing a number of cracks. Maybe I would have been more forgiving of this sloppy intro if the rest of the movie was more steady. And it's not. And the first sign of trouble comes from the iconic yet infamous prank call between Poe and Hux, introducing us to the film's terrible sense of humor. And this is where things are going to differentiate from last time, because instead of going through the movie scene by scene, I'm gonna talk about all the movie's comedy all at once. I'll be doing the same thing for other topics as we move forward to maintain a sense of focus and to better organize this critique. And that's... not something you could have done from the very beginning of the review? No, no, no. We'll get to what you actually have to say about the scene you described and another scene you're showing a screenshot for in a minute. I, I, I want to address this. Let's go ahead and get our story organized after we've started. Dude, this is already going all over the place. Why even bother starting the way you did instead of just starting by going over topics instead of starting scene by scene? Hell, you even have a section for internal consistency which is what the majority of the opening crawl section winds up being about. So it's not like it doesn't fit otherwise. 
you do know how to write videos, right? So it's no secret at this point that The Last Jedi has a comedy problem. It's one of the things that a lot of people talk about when it comes to this movie. And while people really like to make the argument that comedy is subjective, the problem comes into play when you start to really break it down and put it in context. Because for a lot of reasons we're gonna go into, the comedy in this movie does not work. And not because I personally don't find it funny, it actually fails on a fundamental level. And the main reason why is because the style of humor they go for is not appropriate for Star Wars. You know, there are several places where I 100% agree with you, and other critics for that matter. Although I'll get to some of those scenes that you speak of in a bit to point out some of my own disagreement with a comedy point. But, well, first we're about to go off on this not suitable for Star Wars, to which I retort, not really in most cases, actually, especially in accordance with the standard you're about to lay out. I'm not saying that Star Wars can't have comedic moments or do it well, but The Last Jedi is a textbook example of how not to do it. There's no subtlety to how any of it is delivered. What do I mean by that? Well, you've probably heard of something called mood whiplash. When a story tends to go back and forth between being upbeat and lighthearted and having a dark and serious tone. The Last Jedi is the epiphany of this and not in a good way. Epitome. The, the word you're looking for is epitome. Fucking Christ. Anyway, let's look at the example you show on screen, which is a case where I agree that your complaint is valid, even if I don't necessarily have the same problem as you do. Again, using the scenes of the Keepers as slapstick break during the training sequences, which doesn't really need that in order to break tension, in my personal opinion, as some of the way the dialogue is structured does a good job of that already, as well as the more lighthearted nature of Finn and Rose's quest, which we'll certainly talk about later. But I also want to talk about this mood whiplash point. You know that isn't always a bad thing, right? Sometimes it's used in order to elevate a story. There is, after all, a such thing as tragic comedy. You can't think of anyone who's ever done that. Nope, nope, not at all. Fucking read Hamlet sometime, you troglodyte. There are so many moments throughout the movie where an otherwise serious moment is being interrupted by some kind of joke. Huck's trying to pose a threat before getting dumbfounded by a prank call. Okay, so while that did serve a tactical purpose in the form of being a distraction that made the assault that followed more effective, I kind of agree with you that this is a good example of misplaced comedy, although I do not agree that it's simply because of lol lol po does a prank call. Although the fact that the exchange was that one note of a joke was certainly a contributing factor. Like, seriously, he just acted like the guy wasn't talking. It wasn't funny. There was really no joke other than, Haha, he is teasing the military commander, so I can't really fault anyone for this leaving a sour taste in their mouths. Even if I don't agree with the reason it does in this particular instance. This is a case of misplaced comedy that doesn't really do much other than try to be wacky. And the fact that it's just the first real scene of the movie honestly doesn't help. Hux claiming they have the resistance tied at the end of a string before Finn recovers from his injury and starts fumbling around in a suit leaking water everywhere. Okay, so I get what you're trying to say about this, but it is just such a shame that you are full of shit. Yeah, Finn getting out of his healing pod thing, whatever it is, and fumbling around weakly wasn't supposed to be funny. It was supposed to be a display of his determination and drive, as well as serve as the transition from the battle scene towards Rey on Not Dagobah. It's also a display of a character trait in this movie of Finn that, as I'll get into later, you have somehow completely overlooked. But, uh, yeah, this isn't a transition from serious threats into comedy. Hell, based on the wording, seems like you skipped over the entire battle that led up towards Hux telling Snoke that he had the resistance on a string. Or, you know, Snoke force ragdolling Hux around the place because he's pissed off that the resistance got away. You know, the comedy in the middle of a serious scene that later in the video, by the way, you'll you'll blatantly point out. See, if you had complained about that here, then it would at least line up with what you're complaining about, but no. You don't talk about that in the in the comedy section. You have to pick up the scene that isn't even fucking comedic in the slightest to call out. Ray facing her archenemy, but getting awkwardly stunned by his physical features. Fucking really? This is gonna bite you in the ass a lot here in a minute. But note that she asked if he had something he could put on, and then the conversation continued as though nothing happened. A single fucking sentence. Seriously, not even a facial expression other than her looking away for a moment. Seriously, keep in mind how inconsequential this singular quip is. 
Kylo telling his forces to fire on the speeders before getting interrupted by Hux who just says the same thing. And Kylo just gives him an annoyed look. Doesn't at all display the character dynamic between Hux and Kylo. Nope, it's just comedy. But this is another place where I kind of see the complaint at least. See, this dynamic of animosity is pretty much ignored for the rest of the movie and barely used in Rise of Skywalker, except for the big way it's used in Rise of Skywalker. Because in all honesty, they couldn't just make a story fucking simple, could they? There was way too much going on at that point. It's no wonder some of the stuff we talk about later gets lost in the shuffle. But this scene right here? Out of place simply because of how poorly the dynamic was used elsewhere. Which, while feeding into your other problems, isn't a problem with a comedy working on a fundamental level. Chewbacca being pestered by the porks in between more serious scenes. Alright, I don't really have an argument against this. It was shit. Moving on. Leia arguing with Poe over destroying the Dreadnought, followed by Leia telling C-3PO to get rid of that look on his face. Oh, this one is absolutely intended to be intention cunning quip, but it will bite you in the ass later. I'm just here for the bookmark, don't mind me. And many, many other examples that I don't have time to go over. How is this a problem? Well, if I could sum it up in two words, it would be this. Inconsistent tone. The beginning of the movie sets itself up as a dramatic war film, and it features many intense action scenes with a lot of harsh deaths and dark scenes. But then you have those scenes played back to back with scenes that are clearly being played for laughs, and they're in the movie for no reason other than they just wanted to do something funny. So, there's a reason I had to argue against even scenes that I agreed with being poorly executed, because this right here proves that you don't pay attention. There are other reasons for most of these scenes, and again, there's also the cutting of tension that an element of comedy can serve to do. I can only assume that they were going for the dramatic moments followed by jokes formula, which is something you would see in a lot of Marvel movies. But unlike the Marvel movies that are more lighthearted in nature given their source material, Star Wars is meant to be viewed more seriously. I'm sorry. Based on the source material, Star Wars is supposed to be viewed more seriously. I'm feeling like Matt Riddle right now because bruh. I think you're forgetting about the fact that one of the Marvel movies is a reinterpretation of the storyline from the comics about political dissidents and the price of fucking freedom. This is a storyline that ends in the comics with Captain America being executed by lethal injection. You sure you want to go there? And let's not forget Infinity War, aka literal genocide of half of the... I put in human race, but it's not even half the human race. Half of existence. Oh, but it gets far worse than that for you, buddy. It's supposed to be a serious space opera. It's what Star Wars always was. Yeah, guess what else in its source material was a serious space opera? Infinity War! Oh, and let's get back to that Star Wars is super serious shit. Yeah, you're gonna touch on this later, but Star Wars has a lot of comedic moments. Some of which aren't even intentional. No reason to harp on it here because some of it is different and is that's a whole different point, honestly. But let's just say, well, he's about to go full exaggeration mode on our asses. Which is why the constant jokes following dramatic scenes don't work here because it treats Star Wars like a lighthearted comedy. It might have been one thing if they did these jokes every once in a while, but The Last Jedi is completely oversaturated with these types of jokes constantly dumbing down the mood. It's constantly going back and forth between dramatic and silly, and it doesn't register when you're trying to be momentous. It's really not as frequent as you make it out to be, my guy, but really this is just you dragging on the point and accentuating the thing you don't like because you don't like it. So I'm too fucking tired of your bullshit this early in the video to even bother debunking you with hard facts. There are points where it just stops the movie to break the mood, and you're right. In some of those cases, it just doesn't work. Like, for instance, the salt screenshot you put on screen is a very good example of an attempt at a joke that, well, didn't work. There was no reason for it to be there. The only purpose to the plot I can think of is to keep the rating down by showing us that the red stuff all over the plate is is, is not blood. And there's really no joke here, honestly. It, it's just trying to be lighthearted and failing at it. Even if it's short, it definitely serves as a prime example of the worst attempts of injecting comedy into drama or action that you go for. So, you know, that's a couple of picks you hit out of the park. Out of very many. You're creating a scenario where we're supposed to be making a personal connection with these characters and their struggles, to come to term with the losses and sacrifices being made. 
You can't do that when you're constantly bringing the movie to a screeching halt every two minutes just to go, Ha ha, look at us, we're being goofy and doing silly things with awkward pauses. You do know that creating a personal connection with a character is easier if the whole movie isn't serious all the time, right? Like, for real. While the way you described it makes sense, that's not what the majority of your examples are. They are, for the most part, displays of character traits and personality that make it easier to personally connect with a character. See, while I agree that Less Jedi delves quite a bit into the too silly territory, what you're describing is, well, Twilight. The Twilight movies, and books for that matter, are notable for failing because of the ultra-serious tone that everything takes. Characters don't seem to have much personality beyond simply what their role in the story is. For an example of how that would work in The Last Jedi, let's take Leia and her quip towards C-3PO. Coping with stress by putting it off on someone else when you're obviously talking about yourself is, well, both funny and shows a human side to a character who otherwise is just the commander. Hux and Ren being portrayed as competing with each other as rivals. Yeah, I know some people may not agree with humanizing the bad guys, but it can be very important if you're going to have meaningful confrontation like Ren with Luke at the end of this movie. And you're going to point this out in a bit, which is a point that I keep building up to because, oh boy, does it blow almost everything you've said about comedy out of the water. The OT also fucking does this. It makes the film come across as a parody of Star Wars more than anything else, like the Family Guy version of the OT, and even that managed to stay consistent for more than five minutes. I can see they were trying to make this movie more light-hearted and kid-friendly compared to other Star Wars movies, because, you know, it was bought by Disney and Disney likes pandering to kids. Do you want me to list all the adult-oriented movies released under 20th Century Fox after the buyout, or would you rather I just tell you that you're wrong and move on? Oh, but of course... I know what you're thinking. 20th Century Fox is still released those movies as a subsidiary of Disney, and that just goes to show that Disney should be willing to treat Star Wars with the respect it treats these franchises. For one, Lucasfilm is also a subsidiary. Shut up, but I can do you one better. Prove in the closest to objective way possible that the prequel series are not only more catered towards kids than the OT with the MPAA ratings, the OT consistently getting PG ratings in every sequel trilogy movie getting a PG-13 rating. A rating shared, by the way, by Rogue One, a Star Wars movie from the same time period and considered to be more mature in tone than the prequel trilogy, and arguably more mature in tone than the OT. Fair to point out that the close to 40 year separation between the OT and the sequel trilogy, so let's compared to the prequels, which have half the time gap, the same age rating as the OT, with the exception of Revenge of the Sith. So, one of two things is happening there. Either the change in standards over the years has resulted in the same thing being considered appropriate for an older audience over time, or the OT and the prequels are more childish, which I would be inclined to argue against, considering the PG-13 rating wasn't introduced until shortly after Return of the Jedi, but... Tell me which way you think you're wrong, because you damn sure aren't doing anything other than talking out of your ass right now. And that would be fine if it was more scarce with genuine build-up to the more lighthearted stuff. But that's not what The Last Jedi does. The humor never takes a second to breathe when it needs to, interrupting and weakening scenes that are supposed to be grave and solemn. They're horribly timed and misplaced, constantly showing up in moments that don't call for them. Alright, so other than the fact that having a little bit of humor involved in this conversation with Moss that basically served as a debriefing for Finn and Rose's mission was fine, and it's not like it took away from the stakes, keep in mind how minimal this scene, the specific screenshot he's showing is. Moss sounding infatuated and Finn and Rose making a face for one fucking second as the conversation still continues and isn't, you know, halted for the humor. Hell, your statement about having build-up for sillier moments is gonna bite you in the ass, too. In the same point that I've been building up. Man, I did not realize how poor of a choice those words were when I first watched this, did I? They don't allow dramatic scenes to play out naturally, constantly dragging you out of the experience and breaking your investment in the story. Okay, so this one I kind of get being an example of what you're talking about. While it does serve as a display of Luke choosing a more destitute life, indicating how far his resolve to not go back really is when we see it more overtly later, let's be real, it's also kind of dumb. I personally thought it was ill-fitting, but I got why it was there. I, I understood what they were getting at even if I didn't agree with it. And remember how you said these things only serve as a break for the characters to do something wacky? 
once again, I pointed out how one of your examples is showing aspects of a character and not just silly for the sake of silly. Wow. It's almost, it, it's almost like that point of yours was bad and incredibly wrong or something. Huh. There's no sense of balance between these two elements. Ah, yes. These totally happened back to back. Yes, Rose reflecting on her past and then there was nothing before showing this alien lady screaming in fear during a chase scene that, as we all know, was totally already happening when she did that. No room for breath, not that the former was given context for the chase scene, and the latter was contextualized as a moment within the chase scene to break tension. No, 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 it's a joke to get, into, get to breathe, fuck me. Oh yeah, right, about that big point I've been building up to. I'm afraid that's going to have to wait until episode two.